I'm sorry it's been so long since I did the live-action Batman films. Not to mention, I wasn't sure how to handle these two films, especially the second films, because everyone and their mother has made videos making fun of it, so I didn't really think I had anything to add to it. But upon looking up some behind-the-scenes information as to what was going on, I thought it'd be interesting to explore the mindset of the people making these films. After Batman Returns came out, the general consensus was that the film was too dark. It wasn't exactly a family-friendly film that got parents wanting to see with their kids. They did try to sell toys out of Batman Returns, after all. So Warner Brothers figured a change of director was needed. Gone was Tim Burton, enter Joel Schumacher, who coincidentally enough just passed away as I was writing this video. Talk about odd timing. Rest in peace. I'm not too familiar with Joel Schumacher's work, but he managed to have a career before and after his duology of Batman movies. Exiting with Tim Burton was Batman actor Michael Keaton. He met with Schumacher about reprising the role, but decided he didn't like the direction he was taking the franchise. He didn't want to be a cartoon. In fact, this does feel like a soft reboot of the previous two films in some way, although it does keep Michael Goff as Alfred and Pat Hingle as Commissioner Gordon. Instead, we got Val Kilmer in the role of the Dark Knight, and reportedly, or so I've heard, Val Kilmer and Joel Schumacher didn't get along during filming. Their relationship was said to be very, very bad. Rather tellingly, Schumacher does not talk about Kilmer very much on his audio commentary for the film. But in addition to Kilmer, the film would have an all-star cast of its own. Tommy Lee Jones would play Two-Face instead of Billy D. Williams, who despite popular delete did not have his contract bought out so Lee could play Two-Face. Although he would get to play Two-Face years later in the Lego Batman movie, which I have not seen yet by the way. Jim Carrey would play the Riddler, who in the 90s was at the peak of his popularity. Nicole Kidman will play Dr. Chase Meridian, Bruce's new love interest. It's like James Bond, every Batman movie had to have a different girl. And finally we have Chris O'Donnell playing Robin. He was a young and upcoming movie star at the time, 25 years old. Now in case of a contract being bought out, this is actually true with a part of Robin. Tim Burton wanted to cast Marlon Wayans in the role, but Joel Schumacher went with Chris O'Donnell. I think Wayans still receives checks from Warner Bros. to this day because of this. Good for him. From what I gather, filming wasn't exactly smooth. In addition to Val Kilmer and Joel Schumacher butting heads, Jim Carrey on the Howard Stern Show claimed that when he met Tommy Lee Jones, well, I'll just let him tell you. And uh, the maitre d' said, you're working with Tommy Lee Jones, aren't you? I said, yeah, I am. And he said, he's in the back corner. He's having dinner. I said, oh, great. I'll go say hi. And I went up to say hi, and the blood drained from his face <laughs> in such a way that I realized that I had become the face of his pain, mm. you know, or something. And uh, he got up kind of shaking wow. and hugged me and said, I hate you. <laughs> I really don't like you. Oh, my. Wow. And I was like, wow, okay, well, what's going on, man? Like that. And he said, uh, I cannot sanction your buffoonery. Ouch. Not only that, but Joel Schumacher raised more controversy by adding nipples to the bat suit. Yeah, I guess I should just mention that and get it out of the way. Where we last left our hero at the end of Batman Returns was more pugnant and bittersweet. He was unable to save Catwoman, but he still found it in himself to say goodwill toward men and women, a message that always has value. Whereas Schumacher's Batman Forever opens with shots of Batman suiting up, nothing too bad, but then... Can I persuade you to take a sandwich with you, sir? I'll get drive through Yeah. From then on, the plot is thus set up. Batman and Bruce Wayne have to deal with two people who want both sides of his identity dead. Two-Face, who blames Batman for his disfigurement, and Edward Nigma, who Bruce Wayne spurns by turning down his project, and he responds by sending riddles to him. Along the way, Bruce finds himself competing with himself for the affections of Dr. Chase Meridian. At the same time, Bruce meets Dick Grayson, whose family is murdered by Two-Face, even though the character should be a tween at this stage of the storyline, but what do I know? Maybe it had to do with the fact that Robin was college age in the animated series. Batman Forever wasn't exactly a critical darling, but it made a lot of money at the box office. It was pretty much the Batman film that Warner Brothers always wanted. It was safe and marketable. But that being said, do I find the movie good? Well, I don't know if I'd say that. Let's start with our villains before we get to our heroes, shall we? Two-Face, played by Tommy Lee Jones. Well, he's having way too much fun. Ironic, considering he said, I do not sanction your buffoonery. There's one scene at the beginning where he's sort of intimidating. One man is born a hero, his brother a coward. Ladies starve, politicians grow fat. How shall we say he began? It's shown very briefly on a recording Bruce is watching where Harvey Dent was transformed into Two-Face. Was Batman on the witness stand or something? Why was he just sitting there? 
he tends to speak in third person to reflect his duality, which tends to be inconsistent throughout the various adaptations. Supposedly, I've heard that at the end of Batman Returns, Harvey was going to be in Max Shrek's place, and the explosion would have only scarred him, thus setting him up to be Two-Face in this movie. I wish that had happened. Here's the weird thing about this Two-Face. He seems to openly prefer when the coin lands on the bad side, which isn't how he works. He should always abide by whatever side the coin lands on. There's one scene where he keeps flipping to get the result he wants, which is not how it works. Not a very good adaptation of Two-Face. The Riddler, played by Jim Carrey, well, he's basically just Jim Carrey being Jim Carrey. Like I said, it was the 90s. He was at the peak of his popularity then. I think he had a movie every year. His plan is to manipulate brainwaves to become smarter. He even kills his boss, Fred Stickley, and makes it look like a suicide. You are fired! Or should I say... Terminated! He basically wants nothing but revenge upon Bruce Wayne. In fact, he actually manages to successfully figure out that Bruce Wayne is Batman, something no other villain was able to do. Although I do remember an early draft of Batman 89 having Joker unmask him, not sure if I can find it. Although what's weird to me is that he already has Riddler stuff before he becomes the Riddler. How does that work? Our heroes. Well, let's start with Dr. Chase Meridian. Yeah, she's the Batman girl of this movie. She's infatuated with Batman and forms a love triangle with Batman and Bruce. Classic Superman, Clark Kent, Lois Lane love triangle. Of course, none of this matters since she's only seen in this one movie. Gotta admit, Nicole Kidman gave me confused feelings when I was younger. Maybe my first big screen crush. Dick Grayson, who becomes Robin, played by Chris O'Donnell, is actually pretty good. The film does capture his torment of his family's death at the hands of Two-Face pretty well. There are weird scenes, such as where he does the laundry with his karate moves or something. Then he takes the Batmobile out for a stroll, really stupid thing to do. Can I mention that in terms of the new Batmobiles, this one is a huge downgrade compared to the original. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Also, some intruder alert, it reveals the equipment instead of hiding them. The film does take time to build up to Robin, rather than having it just happen, and Bruce is very apprehensive about having a partner. His torment is captured pretty well. Speaking of Bruce... Our hero this time is faced with the idea of having a partner. Having lost his parents, Bruce sympathizes with Dick and takes him in, but he finds the idea of having a partner to be very dangerous. Finally, this film shows Batman being much more thoughtful about killing people. I think it started at the end of Returns, where he tries to convince Selina to stand down instead of killing her boss. He saw what he was becoming, and as he explains to Dick, it didn't end with Joker. He just kept going and was becoming that which he hated. This movie definitely emphasizes the Batman vs. Bruce Wayne battle. In fact, at the end, when Riddler has both Chase and Robin captured, it's meant to reflect his battle with his two identities. Who is he really, Batman or Bruce Wayne? Of course, like he usually does, he chooses to say both. I'd say Val Kilmer does a decent job at playing Batman. He didn't have the best material to work with, but did his best with what he could. He does make some funny faces, though. His ending feels like a natural conclusion to the character art Tim Burton set up. Both Bruce Wayne and Batman. Not because I have to be, now because I choose to be. There was a deleted scene that would have emphasized the Batman vs. Bruce battle more. You see, after being shot by Two-Face, Bruce would have lost his memory of being Batman. Alfred would then tell him what he was trying to do, and Bruce would go down to the cave beneath the cave and see that his parents' death was not his fault. Then he and a giant bat would have become one, reflecting that he had chosen both identities. Unfortunately, it has that awkward line. I'm Batman. Yeah. So really, all this seems like it'd make for a great Batman movie. The struggles between the Bruce Wayne and Batman identity. The themes of loss Bruce and revenge. Wayne, Bruce life trying life to keep family. Dick from going down the same path. A love triangle that shows Bruce trying to have a normal life. A villain who's smart enough to figure out Batman's secret identity. One who wants to destroy Bruce Wayne. One who wants to destroy Batman. Bruce deciding to be Batman not because he has to be, but because he chooses to be. All that sounds like it'd make for a great Batman movie. But what unfortunately wears the movie down? The tone. The tone is dreadfully inconsistent. On one hand, all this stuff of Batman feels like a continuation of Burton's Batman, but every time it's on Riddler and Two-Face, it feels like something out of Adam West Batman. Now, I love Adam West Batman, but it really should just stay in the 60s with the occasional anime project based on its tone being allowed. Not to mention the fact that Jim Carrey and Tommy Lee Jones aren't taking their roles too seriously. The climax of the movie does try to be thought-provoking, 
with Batman having to choose between saving Bruce's love or the Dark Knight's partner. I'm curious what this film would have been like if Burton had directed it, though. The tone would have probably been a lot more consistent. Thank you. But ultimately, Batman Forever, what I will say, there is a good movie in there somewhere, but the tone buries it. Well, that being said, let's move on to Batman and Robin, the movie that basically killed the franchise. Everyone makes videos poking fun at the movie, and it's very easy to do so. So I'm going to take a different approach. Batman Forever was successful enough that Warner Bros. Green lit a sequel, and Joe Schumacher was attached to return, but Val Kilmer would not be returning. I've heard it was due to his bad relationship with Schumacher. So enter George Clooney, who was more well known as a TV star at the time. George Clooney admits the film is bad, even offering the payback anyone who saw it, but he doesn't regret doing the film. After all, it made him a Hollywood star. Chris O'Donnell returns as Robin. In addition to that, we got Arnold Schwarzenegger playing Mr. Freeze, and Uma Furman playing Poison Ivy, and Alicia Silverstone playing Batgirl. More on them in a minute. Basically, from what I can gather, most of the crew knew what they were making, and they certainly don't regret working together, but they admit the film is bad. Chris O'Donnell even said, With Batman Forever, I felt like I was making a movie. With Batman and Robin, I felt like I was making a toy commercial. Well, what is there to say about Batman and Robin that hasn't already been said? It's embarrassing, it's campy, it nearly killed superhero films, it derailed the careers of all involved, which isn't entirely accurate. It's also pretty much unapologetically a giant toy commercial, which is the purpose of everything ever made, but in this one it's the most blatant. The bat nipples are just a tip of the iceberg. I want a car. Chicks dig the car. This is why Superman works alone. Blech. So this is the plot of Batman and Robin. Batman and Robin must learn how to work together to stop Mr. Freeze, who wants to cover the world in ice, who teams up with Poison Ivy, who wants to cover the world in plants, even though their goals are completely incompatible. Oh, and Barbara Gordon shows up to become Batgirl. Oh, not Barbara Gordon. Barbara Wilson. But let's just get this over with as quickly as possible. So Mr. Freeze is basically kind of a mix of the tragic character introduced in Batman the Animated Series and the Adam West TV show. He does genuinely love his wife Nora and wants to save her. Of course, by complete coincidence, Nora has the same disease that Alfred has. More on that in a minute. But to give credit to Arnold, he knows full well what kind of movie he's in, and he just decides to have fun. He has some of the best lines too in his career. I hate when people talk during the movie. Poison Ivy, after being dumped in whatever this stuff is, that doctor is actually the same guy who voiced Riddler in the animated series. Pretty interesting, really. She wants to bring Mother Nature back to the world, doesn't care how many humans have to die, yada yada yada. She tries to make Batman and Robin fight over her despite being a bad guy. Bad, yes. Guy, no. Thank you for that. She also apparently has a crush on Mr. Freeze when she tries to murder Nora. Also, she would have killed Bruce's girlfriend in this movie. I forget her name, she's easily the most forgettable of all the Batman girls. Like Arnold, Uma Thurman is just delightfully hamming it up because she knows what kind of movie she's in. Although she would rebound nicely with the Kill Bill movies, so good for her. Oh, I forgot Bane is in this movie. Bane. Bane. Well... I'm a lover, not a fighter. That's why every Poison Ivy action figure comes complete with At least they admit it. A laundry service that delivers. Wow! That sums up Bane pretty well for this movie. As for our heroes, well, let's start with Batman. George Clooney just sounds really utterly bored. Hi, Freeze. I'm Batman. That is the worst I'm Batman I have ever heard. This movie is about him learning how to accept that he needs help, even though the last film was kind of about that, but Aesop Amnesia, I suppose. There is a surprisingly deep line about the nature of Batman. But what is Batman, if not an effort to master the chaos that sweeps out? I want to use the full clip, but copyright restrictions and all. We'll come back to him because there is one scene I genuinely like. Robin is annoying. He was perfectly fine in Batman Forever, but in this movie, he's nothing but a whiny little brat. It's Batman and Robin, not Robin and Batman, and I'm sick of it. Shut up, dick. Also, he gets his own little motorcycle, or a new toy. He's about as bad as Kung Lao from Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks. Also, there's Batgirl. She's in the movie, I guess. Okay, gonna nitpick a little bit here, but couldn't Alicia Silverstone, at the very least, have worn a red wig? Just saying. I must say it is a little disturbing that Alfred had an entire bat suit designed for her and nobody thinks anything of it. Ew. The film is trying to have an emotional core with Alfred dying. I mean, it makes it very obvious that Alfred is dying in the opening scene. 
I do like how Alfred is continuing to do his job even when faced with his dying moments. The idea of Bruce having to deal with losing his last father figure is a good idea. Shame it's all buried under the camp. There are some good lines, I guess. Also, there's a bunch of things that make no sense, like Poison Ivy randomly bragging the Batgirl how she pulled Nara Freeze's plug. Also, how did Batman get that footage? It wasn't like he could record it. Oh yeah, and Vivica A. Fox is in one scene. Just one scene! Hope she got paid decently for it. Also, another thing that's odd is that Batman and Robin now make public appearances when previously he was averse to the idea of being seen in public, such as when he took Vicky's camera footage. Not that he can really stop that today with the advent of smartphones, but just saying, kinda odd. Like I said, there is one scene I genuinely like. It's when Mr. Freeze is defeated, and Batman tells him that they found and restored Nara, and appeals to Freeze's better nature. Asking him to help him cure Alfred, this is not the same Batman who would casually kill off a random mook. He's appealing to Freeze's better nature. Victor Freeze, help me save another life. Show me how to cure McGregor's syndrome in stage one. To be a better man. He has compassion for his enemies now. That is who Batman is. I'll have your wife move to the lab at Arkham. You'll be able to continue your research there. Anyway, Alfred is saved and all three decide to work together, so all's well that ends well, I guess. We're going to need a bigger cave. Shut up, Alfred. So yeah, maybe a couple of good moments sprinkled in a bunch of really stupid moments. That's Batman and Robin in a nutshell. The film wasn't really a bomb, but the severe fan and critical reaction to it caused Warner Bros. to take a massive look back at the direction they were taking. That being said, there were plans for a fifth Batman film, with Schumacher returning to the direct. The working title was Batman Triumphant, although it was actually Batman Unchained. Nobody's sure where that triumphant came from. Reportedly, it would have featured Scarecrow and Harley Quinn as the villains. Here, Harley would have been reimagined as the Joker's daughter rather than his girlfriend. I remember vaguely hearing about this movie back in the early days of the internet. It was going to be a return to a darker Batman, but the terrible reaction to Batman and Robin basically killed it. Scarecrow was looked to be played by Nick Cage and Courtney Love as Harley Quinn. They would realize their goals of wanting to kill Bruce Wayne and Batman were the same and would team up. Bruce would also have visions of all the previous villains he fought. Danny DeVito's Penguin, Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman, Tommy Lee Jones' Two-Face, Jim Carrey's Riddler, and ending with Jack Nicholson's Joker. Even if the movie sucked, I would have loved to have seen this scene. The idea of Joker returning in Batman's fear toxins would later come to pass in 2015's Batman Arkham Knight. You can see my review for that in the card. So what can we say about Schumacher's Batman? Well, I point out that, yes, tone is a major issue in both films, but there was a genuine sense of love for the character that Schumacher had. He was a comic book fan, after all. From all accounts, Joel Schumacher was a genuinely nice guy who did a lot for people's careers. Then I really want to apologize, because it wasn't my intention. My intention was just to entertain them. In a way, I guess you did, Joel. Rest in peace. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please hit that bell, like, and subscribe button. I think the next superhero movie franchise I'll do will be X-Men. The rise, fall, rebirth, and re-fall of the X-Men movies. Won't that be fun? See you next time.